The programme for this concert on paper looks like a bit of a dog's dinner. And very often programmes that don't seem to have a connection when you first look at them, in the event when you hear them, you feel that it makes a very satisfying balance, like a well-balanced dinner. And my hope is that this particular concert, so full of dramatic contrasts, will add up to a very enjoyable evening. It starts with music from the first opera by one of our most talented composers, Tom Addis. Now this opera was called Powder Her Face. It was satirical, it was highly dramatic, highly erotic, and the music from it is extremely enjoyable and effervescent. It's a suite that he made for the concert hall entitled Overture, Waltz and Finale from Powder Her Face. And I think it shows very cleverly the wonderful, individual, confident, technically brilliant quality that Tom's music has always had. And it's high time that we heard more of his music in Manchester. But then immediately after that, we go to the world of Walter Scott. We go to the Scottish fantasy for violin and orchestra by the great Max Bruch. And this is an example of a work that I've longed to do in Manchester because we know so well his first violin concerto. It's performed somewhere every week, I'm sure. And it's a great work. But he also wrote other violin concertos that we should hear as well. Now this Scottish fantasy is based on Scottish tunes and it comes from the time in the 19th century when so many Europeans looked to Scotland as a place of mystery and magic and exoticism. Nowadays we look to Bali for that, which is a lot further. But in those days, the journey up to Scotland was always one of excitement and interest. Think of Mendelssohn's The Hebrides Overture, one of the most famous examples, or his own Scottish symphony. Now for Bruch, writing just a bit later in the 19th century, the chance to create a virtuoso piece for violin and orchestra was irresistible. The opening is rather solemn, you'll notice, as if we're engaged on some heavyweight emotional task. And the work is so immediately recognisable as being by Bruch, I always think. After the interval, we're going to play one of the most famous symphonies ever written. The last symphony by Tchaikovsky, his sixth. There's always been a great romantic confusion about the meaning of this work and how it related to his death. It seems clear now that in his early 50s, Tchaikovsky was very happy, he was very positive, he was certainly completely unflustered and unnervous about the cholera epidemic that was sweeping the Russian nation. He was not nervous of fate. He was, of course, a highly tense individual. His temperament was very up and down. He could be very depressed, he could be in great high spirits. But life was going as normal for him. And he had an idea for the symphony a few years before he actually wrote it. And he thought it might even be called the program symphony because he had an idea that he wanted to write a very subjective program for a great symphonic masterpiece he hoped it would be but he would never let on what that program was when he came to finish this sixth symphony as we all know now its shape is very very unusual unconventional however familiar the music may be to us now it has this long slow movement at the end and the previous movement the third movement is a wonderful, tempestuous, energetic march which seems to sweep all before it. But the last movement seems to be about resignation, about unfulfilled love, perhaps, anguish, certainly, and a sense of death. I'm not sure that I've ever believed it's about dying in that sense, but I think it's about something that died within him. It's dedicated to a very significant member of his family, his nephew, with whom he lived. They were very close. He was, of course, much younger than, than Tchaikovsky, but they were very close friends and they shared so much all through the second part of Tchaikovsky's life. So what did he mean by calling it the pathétique? What does that word mean? It wasn't his original idea, of course, to call it that at all. He thought it would be called the programme symphony, or a programme symphony, because of the underlying story that he would never reveal. It was like his enigma variations. Then his brother said, 
that's not very convincing. There's no point in calling it a program symphony if you then don't reveal the program. Why don't you, because of its mood, call it tragic? But it does have its sadness, it does have its unfulfilled longing, but it also has a love of life in it. It has a great zest, a very positive energy in it. And perhaps it should have been called the Life Symphony, which was one of the titles that him, Tchaikovsky himself played with as he began to conceive of it. But when his brother Modest suggested the word, pathetic, as we would call it, he of course meant it in its richest poetic, philosophical meaning, as the French still would use it. Pathétique means emotional, emotionally charged, passionate, passional, very full of deep emotion rather than lighter emotion. And so he, in a way he was warning everybody that it was a symphony that had emotional weight in it. He never thought of calling his other symphonies, uh, particular titles, the second one is known as the Little Russian because it has Ukrainian folk tunes in it, but that's more like a commercial label. But the emotional content of this work in the end brought forth this particular title.